this is our team, and we're in Madison, Wisconsin, where fortunately the liquid is becoming, or the lakes are now liquid state. And so in our lab, we focus on uh, the me mechanosensory mechanisms for voice and laryngeal control. And what does that mean? So as I grasp this glass, I can, without looking, grasp it and know from the touch of my fingers how tightly to grasp it. If it were styrofoam, I might sense that and not squeeze it too hard because then I might shatter the styrofoam and burn my hand if it was coffee. If it's glass, I know exactly how tightly I need to grab it simply by the sense of grasp and touch from my fingers. In the larynx, of, uh, there's this mucosal tissue kind of like the inside of your cheek. It's slick, it's kind of gross, some people think, but it's elegant and beautiful, I think, um, that lines the larynx. And it has all of these touch-like receptors that enable us to wiggle and move the larynx and respond to different events in the larynx without looking. So, hi, mom. No hands, no looking. Without eyes, we're able to control the larynx for better and worse. But we don't have the benefit of vision, and we certainly don't have to have a scope going down our throat in order to control the larynx for the things that we do and take for granted, including breathing, swallowing, protecting the airway, yelling at referees when our favorite team isn't doing well, and so forth, uh, as well as voice and speech. When things go well, we don't think about it. But when we have problems, it really gets our attention. And so that's obviously a real uh, a problem that we want to focus on understanding and hopefully helping. So in our team, we also focus on folks with Parkinson's disease as well as individuals with uh, the different subtypes of laryngeal dystonia, one of which is spasmodic dystonia. So the sense of touch um, has often been associated with large football tackles or ballistic events. So something goes down the wrong way and you cough, or you sense some irritation in your throat and you clear your throat. But those mucosal or touch receptors that are often get our attention when things are, are not going well are also important for the more ballet type of events that we perform with the larynx, such as singing or reading a story or giving a presentation and a speech and so forth. And so then we don't really think about it that much, but the brain has to get that information from my fingertips somehow and so there are touch receptors in the fingertips. We've got to get the same position information from the larynx to the brain somehow. So these touch type receptors, and there are other, other types, but these touch receptors that I focus on are probably very important to give the brain a sense of where are the vocal folds, how much do they need to move? Oops, I think I've made an error, let me make a correction. That kind of information is provided by these touch receptors in the larynx. And so it's not just the ballistic movements that are important for the larynx, but also the fine movements that are important as well. So to get a sense of where these are, this would be a view from above of the larynx here. And so this would be where the chin would be, this would be the back of the head, right shoulder would be outside of the neck on this side, and the left side's over here. This would be the right vocal fold, the left vocal fold. And then there's this egg-type shaped structure here, which it's just a cartoon depiction of what we call the arytenoid cartilage, which often is associated with another small cartilage cord called the corniculate. The reason this cartilage is important is because there are muscles that pull the vocal folds together by pulling the cartilages together. There's also a large muscle that pulls the vocal folds apart by moving those arytenoid cartilages apart. Conveniently, those touch receptors are very high in density in the area near that articulator or joint. Uh, that controls vocal fold movement inward or outward. And that's the, that's the specific area that we focus on, and that's probably where a lot of the information that the brain has access to gains that access in terms of what the status of the larynx is during movements. So that's the focus of what the experiments will be that I'll describe. So in a healthy voice, when things go well, this coordination of the ability to hear our voice, the sense of touch that happens inside of the larynx as well, and models or instances when things don't go so well, such as individuals with Parkinson's disease, who can have a very sad, inaudible voice, or people with spasmodic dysphonia, uh, those of you that have a variety of ex experience, excuse me, but I'm having dysphonia at the moment. <laughs> <clears throat> so I sensed that I had a little mucus and I responded to it, and I was aware of what was happening, as well as the dysphonia of my voice, but I could respond by grabbing a sip of water or doing something. Um, there's a degradation in sensory motor control that makes it difficult to return to a normal state of voice or what we would prefer to have an optimal state of voice. And that's what's very frustrating about adductor, abductor, and the different types of parental dysphonia that we want to understand more. 
So how in the world would you test these touch receptors in the larynx? And how many of you, when you went to see the speech pathologist or otolaryngologist, had them look at your vocal folds by putting a scope into your nose and taking a look? How many of you fainted when you had the procedure? <laughs> the only person that raised, oh, did you faint? Yeah, you did? I saw a hand. Okay. Uh, we had one person that reported yes yesterday in our meeting, and it was one of our scientific panel members. I won't tell you who. <laughs> so, the, so the issue is that the larynx is in this difficult to reach place, but we can get there. And so we were able to take some existing technology and blend some bots together to be able to get to that area, and all of you are very familiar with that type of procedure. Um, we're taking a scope and looking through the nose, into the throat. Here's that arytenoid cartilage, that oval shape that has all those touch receptors in it. Those touch receptors are distributed throughout the larynx, but this is the area we're focusing on. Here's the larynx again, and this is that arytenoid corniculate region, the vocal folds on either side and the space that leads to the trachea. So what we do in our experiments is take a scope, and it's specially designed to deliver a puff of air, and we know exactly what the pressure of that area is. We develop a technique to know exactly what our distance is between the scope and the area that has those touch receptors. And it's also a quiet test, because when you release, in order to design this apparatus, you have to have a pressurized air and release that air. So we're able to make sure that it's silent. Because it's not a test of hearing, it's a test of feeling. And the way that that works is similar to a hearing test. We ask the individual, we send a puff of air, please push the button when you feel the puff of air. And if you feel the puff of air and you push the button, we make it softer, kind of like a hearing test. If you feel it again, you push the button, and then we make it softer. And eventually, when you can't feel the puff anymore because we've made that air pressure so small, we raise it up a little bit until you can feel it again. And we continue, kind of like a hearing test, to know exactly what the softest puff of air is at which you can barely feel it. And then we define that pressure and the units of pressure. We use uh, a unit of millimeter with mercury. You can use whatever unit you want to define what the threshold pressure is that you can barely detect that puff of air. And we use that to try to understand how those thresholds, ability to feel the puff of air, may relate to how the mechanosensory, uh, those touch sectors are functioning, and how that might have some association with voice symptoms and so forth, and people with Parkinson's disease as well as spasmodic dysphonia. <coughs> So what have we learned? The so what, what part of this? So the first studies that kind of brought this about were looking at healthy individuals and trying to answer some basic questions. And these two graphs tell the same story. If while you're breathing, you send a puff of air in, you push the button, eventually you find out what that threshold is. In a group of healthy individuals, their thresholds are between about one and three millimeters of mercury. The average is about one millimeter of mercury. That's the pressure at which most people can feel that soft puff of air. But we know that the larynx does all these ballistic events, and so we would hope that the larynx would be very sensitive to protect itself when our goal is to breathe. But what if our goal is to voice? What happens then? Those arytenoid cartilages, the vocal folds, the tissues of the larynx are in movement, and those movements create sensory information that goes through those touch receptors to the brain, as well as movement of air from the lungs through that space as well. So there's all sorts of touch information that's there during voicing that's not there when we're simply breathing, or it's different during breathing. So it would be very convenient if when I'm voicing and all this added touch information is happening in the larynx, if the brain could go, aha, I knew you were going to talk, and so now I can just relax and not be as vigilant to protect the airway, because I know all this sensory information is simply related to the fact that you're talking. So I don't have to declare an emergency just because of these movements with voice. But if I'm simply breathing, and I don't expect these movements and sensory inputs, <clears throat> I may clear my throat or cough. But what if when I went to voice, all these movements <coughs> happened and then <clears throat> All of a sudden, the voice was interrupted because the larynx itself was being highly defensive to protect itself against its own actions. That would be very inconvenient and would interrupt the fluent flow of speech. So what if the brain was able to ignore that and our ability to feel or respond to those puffs of air was less? So this taller bar graph represents that when the person is voicing, sustaining E, for example, and we do the same test, 
the individual requires a stronger puff of air to be able to feel it, which gives us some indication that the brain is, is smart. It can tell what the task is we're trying to achieve, and it only uses sensory information in a way that it's helpful and relevant. During voice, I don't have to sound the alarms. During breathing, I want to be a little bit more cautious. So does that make sense? So that's how we imagine that the world works when things are going well. The other piece of it is that we know, um, and there's a pretty even distribution of men and women here, but we tend to think of spasmodic dysphonia as happening more often in women than men, and many voice disorders in general tend to happen more often in women than men. Maybe it's because we men are stubborn and don't want to go to the doctor as often. That's that, we, there are a number of factors that may account for that. But let's say for a moment that perhaps this is a true thing. Well, we separated the groups and found that men wearing stripes, women in solid, because um, they're more fashionable stripes. I don't know where it is in vogue, so I do the stripes. The thresholds are similar during breathing for men and women. But during voice, during a specific task of voicing that E again, Everybody increased those thresholds, as we would expect, because the brain knows that these movements and the sensory information is going to be there. But the group of women maintained sensitivity to that puff of air more so. It took a smaller puff of air for them to be able to feel it, versus the men had to have a much stronger puff of air to be aware of it. So this, we don't have the answer to how this links, but it may suggest that there are some sensory differences that may set up a situation where men, or sorry, where women are more susceptible to have voice disorders than men. But there's about 10 more experiments we need to do to parse that out under a variety of circumstances. But just suggesting that that may be one thing to consider. So OK, healthy individuals, glad you did that study. What's this have to do with people with spasmodic dysphonia? So we did a similar type of set of experiments. And we had a microphone while we were doing the sensory test, and we had individuals do a variety of not just E, but actual sentences. So some folks have more or less problems during sustained phonation than they do during actual speech. Speech is really where it can become much more difficult. So this very busy graph, I would draw your attention to the white bars, which tell the story that I just pulled for other healthy individuals. We have four women here with spasmodic dysphonia, adductor spasmodic dysphonia. And then in the white bars, we have four, I'm sorry, in the black bars, we have four women without spasmodic dysphonia. Those are our individuals without voice problems. The white bars are our individuals with adductor spasmodic dysphonia. And I'll talk about the gray bars in a little bit. In the black bars, these fit within these horizontal lines, which is what we would expect their ability to feel that puff of air would be during breathing. So here, they're right within that range that we would expect. The women with spasmodic dysphonia are reasonably within that range as well. So we know during breathing tasks from this that the sensory problem doesn't seem to be presenting itself during breathing. But what happens during voice tasks? So during the sustained E, similar to the last experiment, the thresholds go up in the individuals who are healthy and don't have spasmodic dysphonia. What if we have them say a sentence and we stimulate during the vowel, we e yield, the thresholds go up in the individuals without spasmodic dysphonia, and then we have them whisper. So the thresholds go up for our healthy individuals during these tasks when we expect the larynx to be doing something. However, the thresholds are, remain lower in these individuals with adductor spasmodic dysphonia during the E task. The thresholds remain lower, which means their ability to feel it is more sensitive because it's a smaller puff of air when they're saying the sentence. But when they whisper, the thresholds go up as we would expect with the healthy control. So it may be that during the specific task that involves laryngeal voicing and the sustained voice and during the voice-related sentence, that there's a sense that the brain is spending too much time, paying too much attention, being perhaps too defensive to protect the airway during a time when we really want that to shut down or ignore so that we can have fluent voice. During the whisper task, that doesn't seem to be the case. So this task-specific nature of spasmodic dysphonia is certainly consistent with this. The other part that I don't have a complete set of answers for yet is these individuals that were tested with the white bars, that's towards the end of their Botox cycle, before they had their next injection. After Botox, the threshold two weeks after, 
the thresholds remained the same for the respiratory task, but the thresholds went into a range that we would expect. So perhaps there's a motor change that occurs with botulinum toxin injection, but there may be sensory effects as well of this defensive posture of the larynx may have some effect from the spread of Botox beyond the muscle into the mucosa and may have some effects on those touch receptors as well, um, but specifically related to the task. So there's a lot more questions here than answers at this point, but I think it's interesting that perhaps this heightened sensitivity in the larynx is one area we, we really want to focus on and then understand the potential sensory effect that Botox may have as well. So I'm going to advance the slide here. And to summarize, and then I'll show one final slide here, that there are distinct voice deficits in, in different uh, arenas of problems, including adductor spasmodic dysphonia. Abductor spasmodic dysphonia is another area we're going to look at as well. But it, first of all, we want some insight into the, what the problem is and some guidance in terms of how the sensory mechanism may provide some additional avenues for intervention in the future. <coughs> What we'll do, thanks to the support of the National Spasmodic Dysphonia Association and the Dystonia Coalition, is a new study that will uh, parallel some of what I've shown, where we'll use this sensory stimulation to the touch receptors in the larynx and then measure using electroencephalography to measure the electrical response in the part of the brain that receives that sensory input, which may uh, parallel some of the work of the other colleagues that have presented will present today to understand what's happening in the cortex in that area that receives that sensory information. When the sensory information is there, the pump of air, is there a heightened response compared to individuals who are, do not have spasmodic dysphonia? Is there a difference in the timing? And could that give us some surrogate that might help us improve the accuracy and precision of identifying the different types of spasmodic dysphonia and give us a gauge to measure treatment and some ideas for how to improve interventions moving forward? So we have a lot to learn, and that fine motor control piece of the larynx is really important and seems to uh, be important, that sensory and motor link in the larynx. So I'll stop there, and thank you so much.